when I agreed to, to, to talk, um, I thought this would be a cozy little affair with half a dozen people. Um, so it turns out there are more people who are interested in number theory, which is a good thing. And I think it's, uh, it's a great thing that this uh, seminar has been organized. Um, um, I think it's a really nice touch that we can still keep in contact around the world. Okay, so, um, so I want to give a flavor of a Blackboard talk. So I'm using my standard Zoom teaching technique. Um, and what I want to do is talk about a topic which um, began life um, for me about 10 years ago. Um, and I'll try to, to say what's going on. So, um, so first of all, with some background, uh, I want to think about Waring's problem. Um, so Waring's problem um, is to consider representations of a positive integer n as for some of sk powers of natural numbers. And in particular, I'm interested in this talk in the number of representations of an integer n as the sum of sk powers, I'll call that rsk of n. Um, and for this classical problem, it goes back to Waring in 1770, um, we think we know what the answer is to this representation problem. So it's conjectured, I put an asterisk on this, which I'll return to in just a moment, that when s is at least as big as k plus one, the number of representations of n is the sum of s k powers is a quotient of classical gamma functions times a singular series, which I'll define in just a moment, times n to the s over k minus one plus little o of n to the s over k minus one. And I call this an, an asymptotic formula. So the singular series might be zero if there are no local solutions in the problem. Um, it's Defined, it's actually a product of periodic densities, but it can be written in closed form in terms of these classical Gauss, fun, uh, Gauss funds. Um, so E is just equal to 2 pi i times A over QR to the K, as usual. Um, the, the only wrinkle in this, why there's an asterisk, is that if S is K plus 1, you have to take a little care. Um, the singular series may not be nicely convergent. Um, so, um, this is what I've written down here is, is certainly um, valid. Everything makes sense if s is at least k plus two. And so uh, with a number of variables, which is a little larger than k, you expect to understand this problem. You expect to understand this problem very well. That's the conjecture, right? Um, so, um, so what do we know about this kind of problem? So that's um, where some notation comes in handy. So let's, let's define g tilde of k for the number of variables you require to establish this asymptotic formula one, which I have at the top of the, the slide here. Um, so, uh, so that gives me a way of measuring um, what we can actually prove. We conjecture that that should be just k plus one. And um, this is really the starting point for this talk in many ways. There's a nice classical result of Quar from 1938 that shows that with two to the k plus one variables, um, you get to prove this asymptotic formula. And the proof of this is if you've ever studied the circle method, your very first course in the circle method, that's what you prove. That's how you learn about the circle method, most usually. Um, it's a, a very classical sort of sequence of arguments, really dating back to Hardy and Littlewood at the start of the 20th century, the 1920s, even a little before that. And um, uh, Hua introduced some very nice um, refinements involving uh, counting solutions of Bracantian equations to, to make the argument of much more efficient. Um, okay, so that's, that's the, the ancient history. Um, just to complete this picture for the moment, let me tell you about um, what's known in the current state of play. So, um, so this is a topic which has undergone some refinements, but in the case of cubes, if you want to understand the Waring's problem in the case of cubes, then um, still the world record is a result of Vaughan from 1986. So you get the expected asymptotic formula with eight cubes. That's one variable less than what I would have gotten. Um, when K is larger than three, then the recent progress on Vinogradov's mean value theorem plays a role. So once we, uh, the main conjecture in that subject had been proved by Bogdan Benidon and by myself, then um, some work I had in 
2012 um, gives upper bounds on these values, which supersede those of Mark Hua already when k is four or more. And for large values of k, you get a result which is like k squared minus k. Um, with some stuff involving the square root of k. So this is um, quite a precise version of the result that was in a, a paper which uh, started off life actually more or less at the Fields Institute um, in the 2017 program we had there and uh, appeared last year. Uh, Bogan had a what you, might, what you might call a sketch of a, a less explicit bound um, where sketch uh, requires some interpretation. Um, okay, so, uh, so that sort of completes the picture there. And what I wanted to um, sort of say by way of introducing the topic of this talk is that you can obtain similar results to the ones I've mentioned so far for integer valued polynomials. Um, so if I replace x to the k by a polynomial of degree k with rational coefficients that takes integer values, and all of the results that I've explained have analogs um, with the same number of variables. You get an asymptotic formula. Um, the asymptotic formula um, changes a little and the local solubility conditions change a little as well. But that's all a very well understood topic. And in some sense, except for the refinement in the number of variables, even the local solubility issues were very well understood back in the 19, early 1950s thanks to work of Neche and others. So, um, uh, you can see people are buzzing with questions, maybe, or complaints about uh, about what I'm saying. So I'll let I'll let Mike or Alina figure out what's going on there. Um, carry on, sir. Okay, I'm carrying on. Right. So this brings me to uh, uh, a problem. So as as far as I know, the first familiarity I had with with this problem was um, a conference in Lille in 2009, I think, although my memories can be very faulty by this time. Um, so Ben Green posed a problem, which he may well have posed earlier, um, which is to generalize uh, these results from uh, integer value polynomials to certain generalizations of polynomials, which had occurred in um, uh, investigations surrounding um, uh, systems of linear equations and primes. So the whole um, null sequence approach to, to this topic. Uh, so motivated by that, he posed the question of what happens if you replace, as a sort of a simplest example, uh, it replaced the, uh, the squares or a quadratic polynomial with rational coefficients by a bracket polynomial. And by a bracket polynomial, what we mean is something like this an integer times the integer part of that same integer times some real number. And to make this interesting, it's best to keep that real number to be uh, positive and irrational, say. So we had in mind, uh, stressed the, the case of theta equal to the square root of two as a, specially, a special case of this, this problem. So um, for example, uh, can you find an integer s sub zero having the property that whenever you have at least a zero variables, then all large integers n have a representation as the sum of s values of this bracket quadratic polynomial. Um, that's the problem. Um, of course, you can imagine all kinds of variants of this problem, and I'll say something about some of the variants um, later on. But at least uh, that's a good problem to have in mind to begin with. Um, and uh, maybe I can make a couple of observations um, which are not new about this problem. Um, so uh, as uh, Ben pointed out when he presented this problem, of course, uh, if theta, this number theta is a natural number or, or rational, then basically this amounts to understanding what goes on with the polynomial case. You can break into arithmetic progressions, something like this. Um, so uh, you really should stick to the, the case of irrational um, values of theta to make this interesting. And, and really what makes this um, um, rather non-trivial is the observation that these polynomials, these bracket quadratics are not necessarily 
um, don't have the same kind of equidistribution properties that uh, uh, polynomials or rational coefficients have. So um, if you uh, think in terms of the um, Biol equidistribution law in Biol's theorem, then you realize that uh, um, polynomials with rational coefficients have nice equidistribution properties modulo one when you multiply by an irrational number alpha. Um, but this sort of thing can fail for these bracket quadratics. So basically, um, with some examples of these bracket quadratics, um, as, as Ben observed, um, you can sort of uh, relate them to values which are integer. If I multiply by two here, I'm really getting some integer here on the right hand side. And then some term which involves the fractional part of x square root of two squared. And x square root of two is uniformly distributed, it's equidistributed mod one. Um, so it spends um, a fair amount of time close to, in fact, what I mean strictly a fair amount of time, as in not an unfair amount of time, close to, uh, to zero. And that means that it, it spends an unfair amount of time, the square of this spends an unfair amount of time close to zero. So somehow the square of something small tends to be smaller. And so, um, so this has a bias towards being close to zero. And that means that uh, you, you sort of get a failure of equidistribution for, for these things. So that's a, a nice observation, which means that um, one would expect that uh, some fairly routine version of the circle method is not going to be very successful in tackling this problem. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable um, observation. Uh, expectation. Okay, so um, so where do we go with this? Well, um, there's a, a thesis of a student of Ben, um, Vicky Neal, from 2011, where she answers this question. So the answer is yes, uh, there is such a, uh, let me do this, we'll get the question in the same slide. Well, um, so there is such an S0, um, you can represent large integers by values of these, sums of values of these bracket quadratics. Um, so the, the thesis doesn't give a, an explicit value for this, this number S0. Um, it involves um, Fourier analysis on null manifolds. Um, and if you want to, if you're sort of familiar with the circle method, which I don't expect everybody is, you don't have to be for this talk, um, but you might say that the method um, would be similar to Hardy and Littlewood's approach to Waring's problem, where uh, basically Viol's inequality is used on every variable. And the analog of Viol comes from this Fourier analysis on null manifolds. So the number of variables you need is very big. And uh, in the thesis, Vicky expresses the, the point of view that the answer is from the methods is probably closer to a million than 10 to the 100. So, um, um, probably a large number of variables. That's the, um, the upshot of that, uh, that uh, discussion. Um, and so what I want to do in this talk, what am I going to do in this talk? So I want to present, um, first of all, because I think it's fun, a couple of um, results um, of the flavor of Hoyle's lemma, which can be input into the machine that uh, Vicky and um, Ben um, developed. Um, and this was something which um, is almost 10 years old. It dates to uh, very shortly after Vicky's thesis. And it's something that uh, um, at the time I, was, I had in mind, this would probably be an appendix of, of uh, some paper of Vicky and Ben. Um, it might have become joint work at some time. Anyway, nothing's happened with it since. So I'll present it anyway. Um, and then I'll say a bit more about um, some ideas I've had since then, and uh, this gets us into the game of um, speculation about what methods may be used in wider generality. Um, and so the Hoyer's lemma um, discussion, which I'm about to enter into for these bracket quadratics, is particularly elementary in a certain sense. So I think uh, everybody should be able to get something from that. Um, and it's kind of thought provoking. Okay, so let's, let's get into that. So um, so this is where my blackboard technique comes into play. 
Um, so, so let me say a bit about Poirot's lemma. Um, I guess it's a good, good time to pause if there are any questions that people have had in the meantime. Uh, now is a very good time to ask them. I'll carry on and wait for, for an alert from the organizers. So, so what about the classical version of Poirot's lemma? Um, for in the simplest interesting case, which is for the squares. Um, so that allows me to, to get into the, the ideas which we can make use of for um, these bracket quadratics. Um, so what's lemma, what it does is it bounds mean values of exponential sums. And the interesting case in the case of squares is just the fourth moment. Now, of course, in fact, you can analyze this in many different ways, and we can get precise atom products for the number of solutions here. That's not the direction I want to take this because I want to get a crude estimate that motivates what happens for um, these bracket quadratics. So by orthogonality, um, the mean value here is counting solutions of a uh, Daphnitine equation. And I can uh, arrange this guy. Yes, question. Sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? There's just no. a question from uh, from the uh, the audience. Question: no. it's, it's going back a tiny bit. Is this uniform in theta, the bound for s naught? Um, uh, I think in Vicky's work it is. Um, in what I'll present, it certainly is. Um, so, uh, but I, I have a feeling that in Vicky's work. Um, well, I mean, you can get improvements for certain values of theta, but I think there's, a, there's an absolute S0 of theta. Um, we'll see later on, but uh, even if I'm wrong about that, it can be made uniform. So, uh, Thank so, you. so the short Thank answer you. is yes, I guess. Yeah, is that, so is that enough for now? Okay. Um, right, so, so I've arranged the, the Daphantine equation um, with some suitably chosen pluses and minuses here. You can arrange it as a sum of two squares equal to a sum of two squares if you prefer. Um, but now if I want to bound the number of solutions here, you can see that there are two obvious classes of solutions. There's one class where x1 is equal to x2. And if that happens, then x3 is also equal to x4 and, and vice versa, of course. I can reverse the implication if I want. And uh, here the contribution is clearly um, something like capital X squared solutions, right? X choices for X1, um, X choices for X3, and then X2 and X4 are determined. And then the, uh, the other case, well, let me, let me use X3 and X4 as the, um, the sort of a classifying pair of variables. So maybe X3 is not equal to X4. And then what I can do is fix X3 and X4, and then <coughs> um, X1 minus X2, and x1 plus x2 multiply together to get x1 squared minus x2 squared. Um, and that's equal to a fixed integer, which I'll call n of x3, x4, which is just x3 squared minus x4 squared. And that's non-zero. Yeah, that's, that's very strange, not equal to say. Oh yeah, that's not equal to zero. Okay, so um so that's all well and good. And so now we can see that um, each of x1 minus x2 and uh, x1 plus x2, these are divisors of n. And the number of divisors of n is at most n to the epsilon. There we are. So, um, so what have we done here? We've, we've proved Quas lemma already. In fact, for the case k equals 2. Um, what we have here is we've shown that um, this mean value, which we're interested in, we have two classes of solutions that were being counted, uh, a diagonal um, contribution, and then we had another type of solution. There were x squared choices for x3 and x4 in this second class of solutions, and then x1 and x2. Uh, are determined by a divisor function estimate. If I know x1 minus x2 and x1 plus x2, then of course I recover both x1 and x2. Um, 
And so that's uh, that's Wallace Lemma. So we've shown that uh, the total number of solution series at most x to the two plus epsilon. And, and what's important here, so far as the application of the hardy little method goes to Waring's problem, is that we've saved very nearly x squared here. Um, so the degree of this polynomial is two. We've saved very nearly x to the to that degree x squared over the trivial estimate, which would be x to the four. And that's what allows you to prove that uh, um, you get the expected number of representations of an integer as a sum of five squares of natural numbers. And of course, you can say much more precise things about sums of squares with three or four squares, but uh, well, this is uh, what we're doing in this setting of uh, Hoyle's lemma. Okay, so that's the classical version, um, all very straightforward. So what about um, bracket quadratics? So with bracket quadratics, first of all, um, there's no nice factorization of um, x1 times four function of x1 square root of two minus x2 times four function of x2 square root of two. You know, everything gets corrupted. So that goes away, divisor functions go away. It's all very um, frustrating. Um, so it's not at all apparent how you would ever prove a, a lemma of Poir type. Um, so let's, um, let's deal with a, a bracket quadratic and following Ben's lead, um, let's uh, consider the case of theta is square root of two. Um, you'll see that for this argument, this is not particularly special. Um, uh, and we'll, I'll write C of X for X times the floor function of theta times X. Um, so for us, that's X times the floor function of, of uh, square root of two times X. Um, and uh, I'll give a proof of the following more general result in just a moment. So let's record this as a theorem. Um, so you'll see that the argument that I'm explaining, um, I'm about to explain, um, applies if you have um, any theta which is uh, the square root of a, of a rational number. Um, and let's suppose that theta is irrational and positive. <clears throat> and then uh, we've got this analog of Hoyle's lemma. So there's my bracket quadratic x times the floor function of theta times x. And I look at the fourth moment of this, and this is all bounded by x to the two plus epsilon. Um, and I, what I'll do is I'll prove, prove this in the case of, um, of theta equals square root of two. Um, and you can see it's a simple exercise to convert this to a proof for um, more general values of theta of this type, which I've listed here. And the idea, the strategy is to think about sums of two, well, sums or differences of two uh, bracket quadratics. So let's suppose that uh, n is a natural number. Um, so I've had time to sort of refine this since uh, the early days when I thought about this. Um, so you can either look at a sum or a difference of two of these things. So that I claim that the number, I'll call it R of n, of integral solutions um, x1, x2 of x1 um, floor function of square root of 2, x1 minus x2 floor function of square root of 2, x2 equals n. Um, so this, I claim, satisfies um, R of n less than less than n to the epsilon. Um, and if you uh, think about what this implies for uh, a brief moment, this presents the idea of applying exactly the same strategy as we had in our classical proof of Hoyle's lemma. So there we have diagonal solutions. And for the non-diagonal solutions, 
what we did was we looked at the difference of two squares. And it turned out we had an argument involving the divisor function which showed that the number of representations of an integer and non-zero integer, so difference of two squares, grows like n to the epsilon. And we're getting exactly the same result here if we can prove this result about uh, bracket quadratics. So uh, granted this, this idea, um, the proof of this, this uh, result, this lemma, uh, requires lemma for these bracket quadratics follow straight away. And I won't actually say any more about um, that proof other than this, this result about some differences of bracket quadratic polynomials. Good. So, um, so here's, here's the strategy. This is the, the only idea I think that really plays a role here and then you have to use the idea. And the idea, as with most of my ideas, is very unimpressive. So, um, so let's write y sub i for the floor function of square root of two x sub i when i equals one and two. And um, the profound implication of this is that square root of two times x i minus y i is between zero and one for i equals one and two. Good. Um, hope nobody disagrees with this. Uh, okay. So now, <clears throat> what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, square root of two times x i minus y i. Uh, sorry. I should make that a one. Square root of two x one minus y one squared minus square root of two uh, x two minus y two squared. Well, each of these objects is between zero and one, so their squares are also between zero and one, which means that this difference is somewhere between minus one and one. Good. Um, but I can expand this uh, this expression. So if I expand it and use the uh, definition of square root of two, then uh, I get a polynomial on x1 and x1 up to y2, a quadratic polynomial, um, with uh, integer coefficients minus two times square root of two times x1, y1 minus x2, y2. And notice here that um, but this expression is nothing other than x1 times the floor function of square root of 2x1 minus x2 times the floor function of square root of 2x2. So this expression here is supposed to be equal to n. Um, so, so what we've done here is we've shown that uh, this uh, expression 2x1 squared plus y1 squared minus 2x2 squared minus y2 squared minus 2 square root of 2 times n is somewhere in the integral from minus 1 to 1. Uh, so far so good. Um, but that means that we've almost fixed this this integer here on the uh, in the first bracket. Um, so this first integer It is an integer. It's in the interval from two root two n minus one to two root two n plus one. Um, so the left hand side is either uh, the ceiling function of two root two n minus one, or it's the ceiling function of two root two n. Two choices at most. Um, okay, so we almost know what this integer is. So we know what um, x1, y1 minus x2, y2 is, it's n, and this other quadratic expression is also almost fixed. Um, and so what that means is that uh, um, r of n is bounded above by the number of choices of a system of equations. Let me write down that system right here. Um, so x1, y1, minus x2, y2 equals n, let's say, and 2x1 squared plus y1 squared minus 2x2 squared 
minus y two squared equals m, where um, m is in this in this uh, interval two root two n minus one up to two root two n plus one. It's one of two integers. Um, okay, and here's here's the punchline. That means that uh, m plus two times square root of two n. I can rewrite as square root of two x1 plus y1 squared minus square root of two x2 plus y2 squared. Um, so the number of choices for this integer here on the, the left hand side is, is at most two. We know almost exactly what it is. It's one of two integers in um, in the ring z adjoins square root of two. Um, and what we've got here is a product of two, um, or we've got a difference of two squares. So that means that uh, the sum and difference of these two variables, uh, so that's square root of two x1 minus x2 plus y1 minus y2, and the square root of two x1 plus x2 uh, plus y1 plus y2. These are both um, divisors of m plus 2 root 2 times n in um, the ring of integers in q adjoined square root of 2. And we're at most, um, well, if I write this as big O of m plus n to the epsilon, um, choices for these divisors, then uh, that certainly gives an upper bound for for the number of choices for, for these two factors here. Um, and if we what know about, both of these two divisors, you have a question? What about units? What about units? Um, well, the point is that um, the coordinates of both of these um, uh, expressions um, the coordinates are bounded in terms of n as well. So it's, it's a good good point. So both x, x1, all the xi's and the yi's are bounded by um, a constant time square root of n, thanks to, um, thanks to the, you know, the, the setting of the original problem. So we have an upper bound on the size of all of the coordinates, which means that the units are also feed into um, a, a sort of a factor of n to the epsilon in this, in this game. Um, and that's true in generality as well. Of course, like I said, you could look at square root of two and think of an arbitrary um, quadratic irrational. So things get more complicated if the plus number is big, but um, the same conclusion holds. In fact, you have to work harder for it, but, um, but it's all um, quite familiar because we're only looking for um, solutions where the um, coordinates are bounded in a nice way. Um, does that answer the question? Absolutely. Maybe. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, so what we've done is we've bounded the divisors. Um, since uh, given these divisors, we can recover x1, x2, and y1, y2. So this means that the big O of n to the epsilon choices for, for x1, x2, and also, of course, y1 and y2, because those are defined in terms of x1 and x2. And that means that that this number r of n, which I uh, was interested in right at the beginning, is bounded by, well, at most two choices for m times this n to the epsilon. So it's bounded by n to the epsilon, which was what I, what I claimed it would be bounded by. And uh, as I said, that's enough to prove Hoare's lemma for, for this kind of example. So you can see what we did in this problem um, in this uh, and this argument was we started out with our mean value, of course, that converted by orthogonality into a statement which we could say something about if we knew about numbers of representations of integers of differences of two bracket quadratics. And that problem we converted by a bit of subterfuge into a bounded number of problems involving differences of two squares. Um, in, uh, oh, sorry, I'll put it here actually, isn't it? Differences of two squares 
um, uh, representing fixed integers in, in the, the number field that we're working with, in the ring of integers in the number field that we're working with. And so secretly this problem was controlled by a problem in a number field involving actual um, quadratic polynomials. So the argument I've just presented, of course, generalizes from squares to more general quadratic polynomials in the number field. Um, it also generalizes to some extent to higher degree polynomials, but that's a, that's a different topic, um, which uh, depending on how much time I have, <coughs> um, I may say something about later, or well, I will say something about it, but I may not give much in way of details about it. The other problem that you may be um, interested to know about <coughs> is what happens if theta is not a, um, a quadratic irrational. What about more general um, values of theta? And there, that's a, an interesting story. Um, so I don't know a similarly elegant proof in, in that case, although there's a reasonably elegant proof. Um, and maybe I'll give the uh, a shorter version of this um, story since time is, is sort of running down a little. Um, so there are two approaches of this that I know. Um, uh, one involves uh, heavier machinery, although neither of them are particularly easy. Um, so we have an analog of Hoyle's lemma for, um, for these more general irrationals. Um, <clears throat> and maybe I can um, slightly short circuit the whole, the whole thing. So, so again, this is going to involve a number of solutions of a um, Diophantine equation involving these bracket quadratics. And um, on this occasion, what I want to do is consider something which I'll call R star, then the number of solutions of the equation x1 times floor function of x1 theta plus x2 times floor function of x2 theta minus x3 times floor function of x3 theta equal to n. And then the claim well, now we've got three variables, not just two. So the claim is that R star of n is less than less than n to the half plus epsilon here. <clears throat> and to some extent, we're going to um, we're going to use a similar strategy to um, the one which I um, used earlier. So I'll write. Um, uh, y i to be the floor function of theta xi for i equals one, two, three. So, so that means, of course, that zero is less than theta xi minus y is less than one. And then what that means is that if I sum, um, oh, sorry, I should be more careful about this. So if I think of uh, theta x1 minus y1 squared plus theta uh, x2 minus y2 squared uh, minus theta x3 minus y3 squared, then that's between minus one and two because each of the, the squares are between zero and one. So we're just a bounded number of, of terms here. And I can expand uh, that whole expression. So what I find is that theta squared times, um, and again, sorry, I was preparing this for a different example, but so here we go. Theta squared times x1 squared plus x2 squared minus x3 squared minus two theta times x1 y1 plus x2 y2 minus x3 y3 um, plus uh, y1 squared plus y2 squared minus y3 squared. So that whole expression is um, between minus one and two. Um, so now it's not as convenient anymore, right? So uh, theta has no special significance. We don't know that's in the number field. Um, so it's, it's rather hard to think of what to do um, 
in that situation. Um, so what we what we could do is um, consider the values of x1 squared plus x2 squared minus xv squared. Maybe I'll call that L. And x1 y1 plus x2 y2 minus x3 y3. Well, that's actually n. That's the fixed object. And y1 squared plus y2 squared minus y3 squared, and I'll call that m. Um, <clears throat> so what do we know about L, N, and M? We know that uh, L times theta squared minus 2 theta N um, plus uh, M is this expression which you see at the top of the screen. It's essentially fixed for most of the finite number of values of it. We, we also know that uh, L is kind of close to, to M. If you think about it, um, so, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll say that uh, instead that actually that M is rather close to, to N. So Y1 is supposed to be theta times X1 approximately. So, um, so M is roughly theta times M. But there's an error, and if you think about how the error works, um, maybe it's the difference is as big as um, square root of n times a constant. m is theta n plus big O square root of n. And if I fix m, then I know basically what L is. So m is fixed, n is fixed. L is essentially fixed up to a big O of one choices. So what that means is that the, <clears throat> the big O of square root of n uh, choices for L, M, and N, given our fixed choice of N right at the beginning. And what we have to do is to solve these pre equations now for um, the xi's and yi's. And thanks to the work of, uh, of Powell and Jones and the theory of, of these are indefinite quadratic curve forms in, in, uh, in three variables now representing binary quadratic forms, there are big O of L plus M plus N to the epsilon choices for, for the um, Xi and Yi here. And again, a similar observation um, applies concerning uh, what happens with units in this situation as well. So, so again, because the coordinates are all bounded, in, in a sense, there's an extra factor which uh, involves the coordinate size for the Xi's and Yi's, but they're all bounded in terms of N. So you can see here that um, for what happens is we don't get the same simple situation. It's not a problem about number fields, but we can um, understand this in terms of what happens with um, these, uh, this sort of higher um, quadratic form problem. Okay, and, uh, and what, we've, what we've shown then is that R star of n, total number of choices, is indeed bounded by n to the half plus epsilon. And given that result, remember this is all related back to a Daffentine equation in four variables. For every fixed choice of that fourth variable, the n to the half choices there, which is like x, um, then we're getting uh, square root of n choices, which is again like x, choices for the remaining three variables. So that's why we got a x to the two plus epsilon up bound here for the mean value. Okay, so, um, so what that means is that we have an analog of Hoyle's lemma, uh, both for um, quadratic irrational theta, which is a little simpler to describe, but also for, um, for general irrational theta as well. And the fact we've saved almost everything that we should in these mean values, we've saved a factor x squared, means that's good input for the methods of uh, 
of the guineal and, and then. Um, and so with an extra variable, um, their machinery would give you um, a five variable asymptotic formula. Okay, so I wanted to say um, in the last, I think I have five minutes if I understand correctly, um, a little bit more about where you can take this, this next. Um, so, uh, in gradles mean value theorem and generalizations. And I would like to say much more here than, than in fact, I, I can. So, so this, there is at least something that I, I can say, um, which I think is has some sort of interest, um, something provable. And then the rest is more speculative, which I probably won't get to, but uh, never mind. So, um, so let's consider again the situation for this discussion, um, a situation where theta squared is in, in Q and theta is, um, is positive, um, irrational. Um, and um, so if you want to generalize what, um, what we did before, then one possible way that you can sort of convert a problem about bracket polynomials into uh, genuine polynomials would be to consider um, special polynomials, right? So, so I'm gonna consider two polynomials, um, Cxy and Cxy. So these are gonna be polynomials with uh, rational coefficients. Um, and they're going to be defined, this is my way of defining them. So that the kth power of theta x minus y is C of x, y minus theta times C of x, y. And because theta is quadratic, I can always, uh, this, this sort of thing makes sense. Um, and what I can also do is uh, define the number S zero of K. And for the moment, I have a feeling I can probably improve this, but um, let's uh, take uh, Take this to be two to the k when k is two, three, and four, or k times k plus one when k is at least five. Um, and then um, here's a theorem to indicate what kind of thing you can prove. There are some pretty clear generalizations of this, but uh, this illustrates uh, what's possible. So let me take uh, f of x to be either phi of x comma floor function of theta x or c of x comma floor function of theta x um, uh, with x in n, x a natural number. And then the claim is that if I look at uh, a mean value of an exponential sum involving this either of these bracket polynomials uh, of order S zero of K, then this saves um, X to the K very nearly in the exponent. Um, okay, so how, how does this work um, in a nutshell? Um, so the idea is, uh, this is just a sketch proof. Um, so the mean value counts solutions of an equation. Um, that equation is closely connected with the expression you get when you look at k powers of um, <clears throat> so let's see, so here I want um, as before theta x n minus y i to be between zero and one, because I have in mind that y i is going to be theta times x n. So when I look at this um, sort of difference of k powers, um, I've got uh, s copies of these. Um, so this expression is uh, an absolute value smaller than s. And um, the mean value which I have count solutions of 
um, the sum from a equals one to s. Uh, let's let's take uh, one of the cases. Let's take the case of c. Uh, the number of solutions of, of this equation. And you can see it's the same kind of game as we had before. Um, because we know about uh, the, what happens when you look at these theta xi minus y i's, um, that allows me to uh, infer something about the, the conjugate equation. You might think of it as being a conjugate equation. So there are hardly any choices for what goes on with the conjugate equation. So this uh, absolute value is smaller than theta s, it's bounded, just a bounded number of choices for um, what can happen on the right hand side here. So that means that um, if we want to bound the number of solutions of a, um, the equation defined by the mean value, um, what we're really doing is, um, as we need to bound the number of solutions in um, the ring of integers of Q join theta of um, the sum from i equals one to s, and here this s is half of s zero of k by the way, um, of um, theta xi minus y i to the k minus theta xi minus y i to the k. Um, so bracket is on the wrong side there. Um, equal to one of the fixed values which we, we should be choosing here. And by the triangular inequality, it suffices to, to think about what happens when you represent zero. Um, now we know how to do this thanks to the recent work in uh, Vinogradov's mean value theorem. Um, we know how to do this in number fields, but that counts all of the solutions in the number fields. And so what you need is the discrete restriction variant of this. Because that um, nicely takes care of the, uh, the feature of this problem that uh, instead of having order x squared choices for xi and yi in a box of size x, we'll just order x, yi is closely linked to xi. And when you um, make use of that discrete restriction variant, which you can find in the paper on nested efficient congruency. Um, it's part of the whole resolution of Vinogradov's mean value theorem. Um, then you get precisely the estimate that you need to save the correct amount in this, this problem. So again, um, one is able to obtain this variant of, of Quas lemma by reinterpreting everything in terms of numbers of solutions of uh, a strict, uh, an actual polynomial equation, um, but now thanks to the discrete, discrete restriction going to Vinogradov's mean value theorem, you get um, the correct bounds for this that can all be converted back into bounds for just the cape power uh, equation, and hence to the special polynomials here. And um, it occurred to me um, maybe you're interested in is for you know are any of these polynomials in the slightest bit interesting? Well. Um, you know, here's one example just to give a flavor of what kind of polynomials you can attack. They are not um, arbitrary polynomials of this bracket type, but at least there are some sort of vaguely interesting um, versions of these polynomials. Um, this is a degree four polynomial, and one will get a result in, in, uh, in uh, 17 variables for this polynomial from, from these sorts of ideas. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, I'm well out of time. Um, so I can stop there and take any questions or whatever. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Thanks very much, Trevor. So uh, I've never figured out how to clap, but we'll try here. So.